like a lot of little kids of my era, I grew up listening to Muhammad Ali fight. Kind of grew up with it, but I never thought I'd commentate on it. We're going to talk to the guy from England. Let's talk to the guy from England. So he invited me in the ring. And I do, I do this radio interview with Ali in front of everybody. And I'd only been in Vegas four hours. Welcome to the George Groves Boxing Club. I'm George Groves. I'm with this guy, Deck. And today we have one of the most iconic voices in boxing. It is, of course, legendary commentator. Ian Dark. Ian, thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks for joining the club, mate. You're in. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, George. Thanks very much, Deck. It's, it, it's good to be here, and um, I'll try to rack through my memory of, <laughs> of all those old fights. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to go at. Um, lots of boxing. You're working in football now, but for many of our listeners, they'll hear your voice on this pod, and they'll be transported back to a time for me i mean this it's nostalgic that your voice was just the uh, the sound of all my early memories of watching boxing were you even aware of that at the time of what the impact you're making kind of on the sport and on on the fans of a sport uh not really no i mean it's just a job <laughs> yeah. for a commentator you go out you cover fights you try to call them the best way you can of course one thing you find when you're a commentator or a broadcaster is you get a lot better by when you're not there and not doing it anymore <laughs> yeah. so i get a lot of quite nice tweets now saying oh i wish you were back commentating on, the, on this fight again so that's very nice if people have good memories of of the, the fights I commentated on, but I can assure you, I can't live up to that billing. I didn't get them all right, and I made mistakes just like everybody else. <laughs> it's like you, George. They say the same. They're like, bring back George Groves. Yeah, I made a few mistakes as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, was you always a boxing fan? Ian? Like, is it something that you you like when you decide you want to be a commentator? Uh, was it like? Boxing would have been the holy grail, the best sport to have covered? Well, it all happened a bit by accident for me, if I'm honest with you. When I was a little kid, like a lot of little kids of my era, I grew up listening to Muhammad Ali fights and getting up in the morning. And I remember being in tears when he lost to Joe Frazier because he was such a hero of mine. And I used to listen to British heavyweight title fights, you know, with Henry Cooper when yeah. I was a kid. So I kind of grew up with it, but I never thought I'd commentate on it. I was interested in all sports. I played football mainly and, and you know, I love football and I used to go and watch Portsmouth play because I lived down in Portsmouth. But I got the job as a boxing commentator because the great Desmond Lynham used to do it on the BBC radio at that time. And when I joined the BBC radio sports room, he was just becoming a big star on TV, couldn't do the radio anymore. They needed somebody to do it. And by chance, I got the job. And the first fight I covered was Muhammad Ali against Larry Holmes. So it's all downhill from that, isn't it? <laughs> wow, yeah. And you got big shoes to fill as well. Stepping in for Des Lynham. Absolutely. And of course, you know, going way back, way before your time, you're, you're too young, but legendary broadcasters like Eamon Andrews um, and Raymond Glenn Denning used to do the radio boxing commentary. So just getting that gig was incredible for me, really. I mean, I, they used to send me to the Albert Hall, you know, when I was learning to be a boxing commentator and I'd commentate into a little tape machine on these fights on undercards, trying to get the rhythm and call fights correctly. And I got most of them horribly wrong. <laughs> so I used to take them back to the office, the boss would listen and say, you're not ready yet. You're not ready yet. And it was about nine months of doing that kind of thing before they let me loose on the air. Mm. So that was radio commentary. And yeah, that was radio you commentary. You did TV commentary for many years what did you prefer and what are the what are the different challenges um well i did tv for a lot longer mm. so i you know i got a job on sky sports and i did that for the best part of two decades so i i covered a great era of boxing well they're all kind of great eras if you're in them aren't <laughs> yeah. they but i think that one was because it was like the four kings and the Hagler, hearns duran leonard thing going on and you know looking back through the british boxers i covered lennox and and nigel ben and chris eubank nasim hamid joe calzaghi frank bruno so it was it was a wonderful time to commentate on boxing and one of the reasons i don't do it anymore is they offered me to do some boxing on BT Sport when they got some and I thought am I going to be able to do it at that kind of level mm. again because I think George might concur with this to cover boxing and to cover it well you've got to be around it all the time for a long time you've got to hang around with the trainers go to the gyms talk to the fighters 
I'm not sure I'd have had the time to do that. And I'm, you know, you're getting older, so it, it's harder to do, you know, two sports at once. And I and I do football too. So regrettably, that's why I'm not doing it anymore. Mm. So when you was working on the radio, so it's very different from TV commentating, isn't it? You almost you got to paint the picture because we can't see it. We got to listen to it. So you've got to call the action as you see it. Is that harder than TV commentating or is it easier because you just just say what you see? I think on balance it's a bit harder because you've got to keep up with the punches. So when Sugar Ray Leonard's throwing a dozen punches <laughs> yeah. in about one and a half seconds, you can't possibly describe that punch for punch as it's going on. But you're, you're right, George. You've got to be the eyes and ears of the listeners and you've got to give them a pretty good idea of who's winning the fight as you're going along. On the TV, they can see what's happening. They'll have their own view and they'll probably, and this happened quite a bit, not just with me, but other commentators, they're watching it and thinking, what's he talking about? You know, I'm, I'm seeing a different fight here just like judges mm. see different fights which is how we end up with the skewed scoring sometimes mm. yeah so you we mentioned before we started you did call a few of george's fights so latterly towards the end of your your stint george cropped up do you yeah. remember much of that and he always looked like he was going to be a talent and, and a champion to be honest with you and, mm. and the one i remember of course is is the big grudge match with james the gale there was all kinds going on before that wasn't there george yeah <laughs> <laughs> you you both enjoyed it i think though in a way didn't you yeah i did <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah got to ask james and you really won did. but what a uh, win a what won. a win for you that big, was that night a big win yeah of course yeah like um not, what's the words like it wouldn't be career defining but in terms of like the path that my career would have gone down it was definitely a monumental moment and mm. obviously I get it on a split decision it could have gone the other way and you know what would it have, what would have, you know the future have been I don't know so you know I was more than pleased probably in some ways my most happiest win because um, and yeah against someone who I knew and it was a rival and mm. you know it was it was the first time we'd headlined um, a Sky Show, I think, or the first time I had, and definitely ended up being headlined a pay per view show. So I'd been in the sort of pay per view bubble, hanging out with David Hay, fighting on his undercards, yeah. being in the gym with him, and then just seeing how the the sort of the pay per view machine works. But then just yeah, within you know, a really short space of time, being fortunate enough to, to be the top of the bill, won them cards. It was packed you, as well. You right. certainly worked out how the pay per view machine worked when you yeah. fought Carl Frog, yeah. didn't you? With 80,000 people, that's a payday, isn't yeah. it? I'm not, I'm not going to ask you what kind of payday. It's a good one. It's a good one, yeah. Can you remember that? Because you mentioned already you've worked some of the biggest fights in history. Can you remember DeGale Groves, Groves DeGale, just what that felt like, the, the tension, the atmosphere around it? It felt like a proper. Yeah. A proper rivalry. Yeah, it did. And sometimes you get the feeling that the ballyhoo before a fight and all the verbal crossfires is a bit phony and you don't buy into it really. Mm. But I did feel with that it was genuine. And that, of course, gives the fight that little bit more of an edge as well. And it's great when two fighters who are somewhere around their peak are meeting at the right kind of time. I mean, how often in history has the fight come along too late that you wanted to see? Think of Pacquiao, Mayweather, way too late. Lennox Lewis, Mike Tyson, way too late, really, for it to have the significance. But that one was was great in that way. And I do think George deserved the decision, though it was on the close side. Mm. That's why he's on the Yeah, board. that's why he's there. You <laughs> can stay. That, <laughs> 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 I, 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 let me tell you a story about that, actually, just yeah. while, we're, while we're digressing. Um, um, this sounds like name dropping, but when I worked for BBC Radio, I was working a fight in Atlanta, City, and I heard that Sugar Ray Leonard was in town uh, to commentate for HBO. So I thought this would be good. I'll get an interview with Sugar Ray Leonard. So I rang, I rang up and asked for him at his hotel. I found out where he was staying. They put me straight through to his room, <laughs> and, he, and he answered the phone. And he says to me, he goes, he said, "Who do you say you were from?" I said, "From BBC Radio in, in London. My name's um, Ian, Ian Dark." And he goes, "Who won my fight against uh, Hagler? How did you score it?" I said. Yeah, I thought you won it by a round or two. Be here at four thirty, room four one nine. I'm pretty sure that yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that if I'd said, you know, I think Hagler won it, mm. he just said, No, we're not talking. I think <laughs> boxers are sensitive like that. He probably would have done I've been in a press conference before where someone's asked I won't name who it is, but they've said, Who do you think's gonna like do you think I'm gonna win this fight? Put your hand up. 
And then people who didn't put their hand up, he was like, can you leave then? Because I don't want to speak to people who don't want to win. Uh, who don't think I'm going to win. That, that's pathetic. Yeah, yeah they've genuinely, it. like, it's that, it's that close. So like, I, made, well, I made you leave that. Day, yeah, yeah, no, it was George. <laughs> that was before the girl fight. <laughs> um, comment, go on, George. Go on. Yeah. Your voice, Ian, is it, it's commanding, right? It, it, it has an authority to it, right? And I mean that in a great way. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I, thank you for saying so. But, if yeah, it does. You, when, you, when you when you say something, it's very much like, oh, okay, but I've got to listen. You you, you have that tone. Is that, have you always had that, or is that something you've built on? And also, when you're delivering your commentary for mm. boxing, in particular, maybe, did you always have confidence in what you were saying, or was it tough at the start? Tough at the start. No, I didn't always have confidence in what I was saying when I was starting out. You're always thinking in a slightly insecure way when you're calling a fight because boxing's unlike a lot of sports. You don't actually know who's winning. All you can convey with the guy alongside you is who you think is winning. I mean, it's his scorecard they put up, you know, who the, the ex-pro working with you. But you're giving a pretty good indication, so you hope you're not leading people down the garden path a bit. But, I mean, as a general approach to broadcasting... Mine was always based on something I read. The great football commentator Brian Moore said, be a good guest in people's living room. So I was never frightened, really, to... You're calling the fight, but if there was a chance for, to just lighten it up or have a little bit of banter with the, with the co-commentator as well, you try to build that in as well so there's a bit of light and shade. And it's, after all, for people sitting at home just switching on their TV... It's, it's entertainment. Mm. They've got a 400 night. other channels they can watch. Mm. Mm. Do you, did you, you and maybe, and Jim or you and anyone else, did you have any real stinkers where you've watched a fight, you've conveyed it a certain way, and then afterwards you've gone, oh no, everyone else thinks the other bloke won? I'm trying to think back on that. I mean, I can remember the fight with Hay and Value Ev. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was a difficult one because I was commentating with Jim Watt on that fight. I mean, as you remember, not a lot was happening, was there? A lot, <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of punches were landing tuck. in the fight. Yeah. And Jim kept saying in the fight, I mean, Jim's brilliant as, as an analyst, but on this occasion, he said about the eighth round, I don't, he said, I don't think David Hayes doing enough to take away this man's title. And I thought, I think he is. I'm thinking to <laughs> oh, <myself. no. laughs> So I, 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 I came back with and I said, but do you think Value F's doing enough to keep it, Jim? Because mm. it doesn't look like it. Yeah. And that was the only kind of... But I thought I had to do that bit of correction on that. And, and of course, Hay did win because you are frightened. I mean, another fight, Lennox Lewis, Evander Holyfield, the one where he's robbed mm. in New the York. Draw. They call it a draw. He's, he's obviously won the fight and they haven't given it to him. But I think I said in about the 10th round of that because I was conscious of how much we were kind of leading it, people to think, Lennox Lewis is going to become heavyweight cha undisputed heavyweight champion here. And I remember saying in the 10th round, we've got to remember here that you never can be sure of how the judges in America are scoring this. This is a Don King promotion in New York. So what the scorecards are saying, I've no idea, but we think Lennox Lewis is dominating this. And, and I'm glad I built that bridge back because, you know, six minutes later, we got those crazy scorecards. Mm. We hear a lot about commentary being in the, pre in the prep and that goes for all sports, boxing and football and everything else. How much preparation are you doing for boxing? What, what are you, what's your routine? Um, generally, when I was covering a big fight, say, in Las Vegas, they'd fly us out on the Sunday before and the fight would be the following Saturday. Mm. That was largely because Sky, you might remember, used to do all those countdown shows. Oh, yeah. So we'd have to do loads of stuff for these yeah. countdown I remember the Nazi, to camera, Nazi interviews, yeah. So we'd be there. Largely, my preparation, apart from sort of just checking the records, knockout records, and, and the, the sure, sheer stats of the two fighters, would be just to hang around the two camps and maybe talk to a trainer in the bar and just pull him to one side. From And over five or six days, you get plenty of chance to do that. It's, it was quite accessible in those days except Mike Tyson's camp. You couldn't get near. <laughs> you couldn't get near him. He had these heavies around him for a while, especially when he was controlled by Don King. And, um, you know, they were very, very silly in not letting you anywhere near him, even to grab a minute and a minute and a half of, of an interview. 
Um, mm. And that got silly. But, you know, somebody like Holyfield was fantastic. You you could ring his room, at, you know, six o'clock the night before the fight, and he'd say, yeah, come around, have a cup of coffee, we'll have, ch- have a chat. And he, I mean, amazingly, he did that because I needed a last-minute interview with him that my editor said, we need some sort of later stuff with Holyfield. We got all this other stuff you did with him. I said, he's not going to do anything now. They've weighed in. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I, they said, "We'll ring him anyway." So I rang him, and he said, "Yeah, he, he picked up the phone. Not one of his, not one of his underlings, or you know, mm. somebody in the camp. It's Evander here. Yeah, what do you want?" I said, I just need to do sort of get another one minute, or yeah, come round. He said, "We're we'll having tea in a minute." <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> it's fantastic. Isn't it? I mean, I just couldn't believe my luck. You know yeah. that 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 happened, but. You know, I think if you work in any branch of the media, it's like don't ask, don't get. It's true. So, yeah. Is there? Anything that stands out to you and where you've got an obscure fact that's just brilliant that no one's heard of, you know, like, because it's like a little you, grenade you, in you your as, pocket. You as the commentator, you know, you might be painting a picture of their, you know, their previous fights or whatnot, you know, but have you got like just an absolute gem? Oh, I, I'm trying to think of someone off the top of my head. It's one of those where I'd have to rack my brains. You hope you've picked up some great little line it's great if you've got some kind of color line about mm. a, a fighter just aside from his boxing i, I remember we, do you remember darren corbett who mm. used to fight yeah. on mostly undercards you know and we found out he was an alvis presley impersonator when he wasn't <laughs> when he wasn't boxing and he was in this quite dull fight one night where every round was the same and i was commentating with glenn mccrory as i did for for many years and we kind of descended into this kind of silly thing where we kept mentioning Elvis Presley <laughs> songs. And I said, I think I said, I said, no, you never know how the judges might, might call this. I said, but I guess we can't go on forever with suspicious minds. And as it went on, <laughs> and Glenn had come out something like, he, d- he certainly hasn't got a wooden heart. I mean, it was terrible, really. But <laughs> yeah, by the 10th round, you saw we were getting oh, a bit we didn't, yeah, we didn't overdo it quite that much. But <laughs> yeah, those little nuggets, though, in the fight week that cr- crop up, that you sort of put them in your back pocket and you're like, right, I got it for, for yeah. a quiet round or for, you know, for the ring walk when I w- need a bit of colour and you can just sprinkle them in. Yeah, you can overdo that. You can overdo, you know, putting in color lines because it's a serious business, isn't mm. it? Boxing, it's not, a, it's not a vaudeville act. But if there's something I think that makes people who don't really care who wins the fight sitting at home want to root for one guy over the other one, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Giving the fighter's backstory is is quite interesting and then you kind of you get involved in the plot. It's like those very good idea they had on um HBO when they started preceding the fights, you remember those twenty four seven series. Brilliant. So you watched four of those, and by the end of that, you were thinking, "I've got to watch yeah, what happens here." I know fight. all about all these little rows they had in the camp, and how he changed the trainer at the the last minute, and how this guy was, you know, came off the streets of Boston, you know, and he was living living rough for so many years, and he's turned himself into this champion. So you wanted to see what happened in the final instalment. So you try to build a bit of that in, into it. It's not just fighter A, B, fighter B. Mm. It's like Adam Azim's goat, isn't it? The, per- the perfect colour. Yeah. You know, he's got a pet goat. Adam Azim's got a pet goat. <laughs> really? Yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, so, no, so, you, that's, that's a great it's perfect. It's a perfect one yeah. for, the, uh, for the ring walk. Um, we had Colin Hart in and he told us some amazing Muhammad Ali stories. And so that's where your journey started. Muhammad Ali... Well, that was I, abroad. I only covered one fight of Muhammad yeah. Ali, the, the very first fight I covered. Yeah. I wasn't sent as a commentator. I was just sent to do reports because oh, okay. BBC Radio didn't have the rights for it, but they obviously needed to be there to send, you know, report, have a reports on what became Five Live. It was Radio 2 then. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'd never been to America. I'd never covered a fight. Um uh, and here I was in Las Vegas, <laughs> and I, 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 Colin Hart was great to me on that trip. Oh, was he? he was even then he was a bit of a doyen among the mm. the boxing writers, and he, he kind of held my hand through it and said, "Well, this is what you know. This is what we do. We're going to go down to the gym in a minute. You know, Ali will be doing a little workout, and so he said, come down there and you know see if you can get some kind of interview." So I went down to the gym on the first day I was there I'd only been in Las Vegas about four hours so I went down with my tape machine and I rather amateurishly sidled up to Angelo Dundee <coughs> who is uh, Ali's trainer of course and said do you think at some point in the week I'd be able to do an interview with Muhammad and he, he sort of looked at me like I'd, <laughs> I'd gone mad, <laughs> mad and he said um, 
he shouted out to Ali, who was shadow boxing in the ring in front of this quite a big crowd. He goes, Muhammad, we got a guy here from England. And then Ali went into all this jive talk about, to the crowd, he goes, England's the only place they know about boxing because the British Boxing Board of Control was, you know, kept recognizing him as champion even during the draft dodging yeah. bit. We're going to talk to the guy from England. Let's talk to the guy from England. So he invited me in the ring. And I do, I do this radio interview with Ali in front of everybody. And I'd only been in Vegas four hours. So, of course, I didn't have to do much. He did all the talking. Yeah. But it was amazing. And your editors were probably very happy they about that. They were very happy with me. They thought I was some kind of genius. So yeah. I definitely wasn't. <laughs> That's, I mean, what an introduction to boxing. What an introduction to Ali. Yeah, but it was sad. It was the saddest, you know, all, I, fight. all those fights I covered, the saddest fight I ever covered was that one, really. I mean, mm. it, well, there were a couple of others where boxers had, you know, blood clot on the brain. Mm. You know, they were tragedies. But that really did leave a big mark. And I always remember a guy sitting behind me at that fight because he took a terrible beating that night, mm. Harley. He was 38 and he was just a shell of himself and Holmes was landing all kind of punches it should have been stopped a long time before it was and one guy in the crowd said, shouted out i love you ali but you're breaking my heart here mm. i kind of rang it reverberate i used that line on the reports mm. and um yeah yeah so, so it's a tough introduction was that maybe served yeah, you like well as well to yeah toughen you up early doors to yeah i mean it was a, it wasn't the story because it had all been built up like it was he gonna perf you know pull off another miracle was he gonna do it again and reality crowded in that night in mm -hmm. a big way can you remember what the atmosphere was like after the fight in the, the press conference and stuff and you know the immediate aftermath was it a feeling of mm. of sort of was it somber yeah solemn yeah. somber worrying i'd say mm. And Ali turned up with dark glasses on and his face a complete He did the press conference. Yes, he did the press conference. Wow. And he, I, he turned to, Hol I remember him turning to Holmes and saying, yeah, you said you were, he was still trying to joke and saying, <laughs> you said you were my friend. Why did you do that to me? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you did Hagler Hearns. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I put, that, I put that number one on my list of fights I, I covered. Hagler Hearns, just the atmosphere around that. And it was great for the British audience that night because for some reason or another, and I can't remember why, it was an outdoor fight at Caesar's Palace, but it was very late off, very late in the ring. There'd been some kind of delays in the background, but that meant it was on in Britain at about 6 a.m., oh. so a hell of a lot more people heard it than we thought we were going to hear it. We you know, thought it would be 4.30 a.m. and mm. only the mm. diehards had listened. But I, I met a lot of people when I came home who heard the fight on the on the radio. I mean, I did it with Colin Hart and it's the only time I've ever known Colin at the end of that amazing first round, you know, the, probably the greatest round of boxing, you know, you'll ever see Hagler and Hearns. Colin couldn't speak. He was, <laughs> he was absolutely speechless. I don't, in, eventually he kind of spluttered out, I don't believe, I've, you know, what I've just witnessed there. Mm. Can you remember at the time, because you have a, a, a great responsibility as well as the, the person who's relaying this back to people at, at back yeah. home. Like when that is unfolding, clearly something that is going to transcend the sport. Are you even, is that registering or are you just literally just trying to get across what you're seeing? Or is there, is there a feeling of like, okay, no, this is special? I, I guess in the back of your mind, there's a feeling that this is going to send reverberations around the world of sport. People are going to be talking about this. But really that manic first round, I've got my commentary of it somewhere and I'm frankly I'm a bit embarrassed about it now because <laughs> it, it was sort of feverishly exciting and crazy and I'm yeah but you are you're thinking this is this is a fight for the ages and it, and it definitely was I mean it only lasted eight minutes but what an eight <laughs> minutes and I know there's a lot of younger people who, who tune into boxing now and they probably like watching YouTubers and all that kind of thing but I do advise them go to YouTube and put in Hagler Hearns and and, and have a look at that mm. can you prepare for a, a fight like that like you, mm. beforehand even if you expected that could you prepare for having to commentate on a fight like that? Not really, no, because you just don't expect that, do you? You don't expect it to turn out into a furious and frenetic war, which is what it was. And, you know, there was a great bit in the, at the end of the second round of that fight where Hagler's cut you know, in all these exchanges mm. and Richard Steele goes over to the corner and says to him, 
Marvin, Marvin. And he looks up and he goes, can you see okay? And the haggler's response was, I ain't missing, am I? <laughs> <laughs> and he, of course, he, you know, a couple of minutes later, he'd won the fight. But mm. I, I mean, the background to that fight was, I thought was fascinating. A lot of people made Hearns the favorite to win it because he's such a big punching welterweight, but he was moving up to Hagler's division. You know, Hagler was the middleweight king and Hagler was basically saying to him, you think you're the puncher against me? Come on then, let's do this. Mm, yeah. I'll, I'll show you who's, you know, this is, you're in with the middleweight here, a proper middleweight, a top class middleweight. And that's what he did really. It's amazing to think that he was the favorite in that fight because now going up, that's two divisions these days, going yeah. up, going up from 47 to 60. In the build-up to that fight, how what was the what was the talk like? How were, was it fractious? Were they was it like an explosive build-up? Can you remember? I can't remember a lot of it, but it didn't need too no. much selling mm. really at the time because it, it was two fighters who were you know bang there and all right. Hearns had Hearns had lost to Sugar Ray Leonard, hadn't he? In in that fantastic 1981 fight, but still came out really with his reputation enhanced because he'd been leading for a long way in the fight. Could have gone either way in a way. In the end, Leonard got it done. So, but yeah, I think we had this image of him as as the big punch. Remember what he did to Roberto yeah. Duran? You know, the pole axing punch. So I think a lot of the aura around Hearns was based around that kind of thing. And a lot of people thought, yeah, well, Hagler's good, but this guy, you know, he might take out anybody. Mm, so yeah. that's why the betting, I think, was kind of as it was. Mm. Great fight that. I remember, oh, gosh, yeah. I remember interviewing you at the side of Wembley pitch when you just announced the Frotch rematch and you said, this is Hagler Hearns, this is a three round fight. Yeah, it I remember, <laughs> I remember that sticking in my head. Yeah, yeah, but that was, that, was you, that was a narrative you wanted to put across. It was like, I'm going to go, go at him this time. Yeah, that would have been better. I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been really good, wouldn't it? We just jumped on it. It's like, yeah, it's a three round fight. It's a three round fight. Never the plan. You can't quite engineer the way the fight's no. going to go. You, you, you've obviously, George, you must know this, you, you plan a strategy mm -hmm. and you have a vision in your head. You've probably done it a thousand times when you go to sleep in the build-up of how it might go, but you've got to be able to improvise on the night, haven't you? Absolutely. I mean, in, in Hagler Hearns, I think Hagler, Hagler wants that fight. He's pressed that fight. And, perfect for and, him. And Hearns can't do anything apart from fight back. Yeah. Uh, and because he's so ferocious. Um, Hagler and it's just like who's gonna who's gonna get it but I suppose we're, I'm always watching it with the hindsight of knowing you know what happens Hagler gets him so mm. I'm like uh, it looks like Hagler's gonna get him and he does is there like is there ever a moment Ian where you've just you've absolutely feel like you've nailed it you've put together a, a turn of phrase that stands out for the ages for you and you think um I couldn't have said that any better if I tried um I quite liked my payoff line on when Lennox Lewis fought Rackman the second time and he'd lost the first fight, hadn't he? Taken yeah. his eye off the ball a bit for once <laughs> in the training. And um, he produced that great knockout punch. And I think my line was revenge, redemption for Lennox Lewis. Nice. And, and sometimes the, the shorter lines. I think the other one with Lennox was the American press. There was a lot of stuff going on in the American press, but they were dissing lennox over there and they said oh you know if you cut him some guy wrote if you cut him open you'll find out he's he's filled with old newspapers he's he's fine wine you know grape juice passed off as fine wine they so there was a lot of anti-lennox feeling it then he knocked out galotter in 95 seconds uh and i think my line at the end of that is and now will they believe in lennox lewis <laughs> <laughs> how were those lennox lewis days he was quite cool Lennox, it, it, it was weird. You could interview him. I probably interviewed him 150 times ahead of fights or around fights, but it, it was always like it was the first time we'd met. <laughs> Every time he, he'd walk in the room and sit down, sit in front of the microphone, I'd do the, the questions and he'd get up and walk out again. But I think he was in, now I think of it, he was in fight zone the whole time. This is fight week. This is something I do in fight week. I come in here, I do the interview with Sky. I go away again, back to training. So I think he was always in the zone. The only time he didn't do that was ahead of that second fight with Rackman. And he went and sat down and, and he said, and he actually said, hi, Ian, how are you? I thought, blimey, really? <laughs> <laughs> thought, what's, that, what's going on here? And he, and he tapped me on the knee at the end of the interview and said, and, and said nothing's going to go wrong this time.
just he's just like I'm going I'm going to take this guy out. He you knew know? it. Yeah, yeah. nothing's it's- going wrong this time. I, I thought. Bet on him. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's, is that where he's in a better frame of mind, or is that just where he wants to be a nicer guy, so people are saying nicer things about him? I don't think so. I think he was just super pumped up mm. for the fight and felt felt really good ahead of it. And I think he knew what he was going to do in the second fight. Mm. He you know, knew how he duffed it up the first time, really. But he went off swanning off, didn't he, with the the cast of Ocean's, Ocean's Eleven. Eleven? Yeah. And he Lennox had to admit if he was sitting here where I'm sitting now. Um, that he didn't get that right that first one yeah you know those those lines the, the memorable ones that stick in your mind do you prepare them like no. you know are you thinking because sometimes when i'm writing a report i'm i'm i've thought if this happens i'll probably write this this yeah. is going to be the story do you ever think right if lennox does this is re- revenge redemption let's keep it short and sweet or do they just come to you when you're well, in the moment is it important to keep the sort of the canvas clean i'm sound like i'm dodging the question a bit here <laughs> but- feel free <laughs> but I probably did sometimes think about if there was a scenario that might be a good thing to to say, but I think you can overdo that. Hundred percent. You've got to really, with all sport, not just boxing. If you're a commentator, you've got to let the action dictate to you how you're commentating. So I think one mistake sometimes young commentators make is they've got a whole load of preparation, and they want to tell you everything they've prepared about yeah. the fight but take your eye off the notes and watch what's happening because it isn't what you thought was going to happen yeah. so often it boxing surprises you even on little undercard fights i used to commentate on and you think mm, he's the prospect and he's the journeyman and it, this is how it's going to be but occasionally it wasn't that way around at, at all the prospect wasn't as good as they thought and the, and the other guy came in with a yeah. with a great mm. attitude and probably got robbed you know yeah. this is what happened in the end usually yeah because you've got to be fluid haven't you like if you're calling the fight because you can't sometimes it feels like you'll watch people and you think they've or half made up their mind what the result's going to be or they've said something about one fighter in the first round and they think oh i've got to sort of stick to my story now <laughs> you know he's landing the right hand he hasn't landed the right hand he hasn't yeah. landed it for four rounds you know so it is it is hard but yeah and but that must make sense where if you've got a sort of a, a, a nice sort of line, redemption, revenge, mm. have you ever had it where you, you, won, you, you, you've, you haven't said redemption, revenge, you've said redemption, he, he won a bit. Or you said, and then the other <laughs> way home you're going, fucking should have been redemption, revenge. That, it's like when you leave, you leave the party and you had a great yeah. comeback <laughs> one liner. Like, and you duffed it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's true too. You, that can happen as well that you, you get home at night and you might listen back to it and think, uh, I could have come up with something better there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I oft, I've often thought that as well. I mean, I think when you put your microphone down at the end of covering something, you think, well, usually what I think is, well, I think we got away with that. <laughs> I, 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 I <laughs> Nothing's gone wrong. That's what I used to think. I, I certainly do that covering football because you can call so much wrong in football these days with, you know, five substitute rules and you know, the various VAR things. It's uh, there's, there's a lot to get wrong. And boxing was the same as well. You, you hoped that you'd guided people in the in the right direction, but you never could tell with, with the judges. Yeah. Um, I can remember a couple of times where I threw my pen down at the end of the fight, I was so disgusted with the decision. And one of those was Michael Brody fighting Willie Horine in Manchester. And I was absolutely convinced that Brody had won and won the world title. And put it this way, I knew of a few connections between the WBC and the guy who managed Willie Horine. And Horine got given the decision. And afterwards, there was a bomb scare, and I was standing outside with one of the judges, Bob Logis. Do you remember him, the he's, Belgian guy? He's now the, e, the EBU president, I think. Right, okay. Okay, so I remember he said to me, oh, good fight, wasn't it? I said, yeah, and I, I was still so seething. I said, I said what, what make of blindfolds were you wearing when you watched it? Because <laughs> he'd scored it. It was, it was a scandal, really, mm. that one. I mean, George, you'd have seen it, wouldn't you? You'd, mm. you'd have both seen yeah. fights where you, you're angry at, at you know that something, well, is it incompetence or is it something worse than that? It's interesting you say that because you, with football, obviously in the top corner, the score's there and it's black and white and that's, regardless of what you say, that's what happens. But as the commentator, what you say and what the co-commentator says, 
especially this this day and age of social media, mm. the whole narrative can be formed off what you're saying and what the score, the you know the the unofficial scorecard says, and people watching that they're tweeting it, and all of a sudden everyone thinks everyone thinks something is happening. One thing is happening when actually in the ring it might be unfolding slightly differently. The one that springs to mind is Jack Catterall against Josh Taylor, yeah. where in America it wasn't seen as a big scandal because really? the American comms Andre Ward thought Josh Taylor was doing better than many people in Britain thought. So in America, they didn't see it as a scream up, whereas in the UK, it was seen as one of the biggest scream ups ever. Mm. And it was just based on the commentary and, mm. the, and the, the output of the, the broadcast. Yeah. So there's, do you feel like, or did you feel like a sense of responsibility to make sure that you're seeing it right? Because it can sort of sway what people are seeing and the narrative of the fight. Uh, it's a really good question, that, I think. Mm. Um, Catterall won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I did there. And look, how many, I don't know about millions of dollars, but how much money it's cost him oh. that, you know, because you said, George, earlier on about like a crossroads in your career. If that close fight with the Gale, they'd scored it the other way, which way would your career have gone then? And how much money might that have cost you? Might you have ever fought in front of 80,000 with Froch, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, these are vital things, aren't they, mm. to, to get right. But yes, I mean, you do have a responsibility to not be saying this is a big scandal when it might not be. Um, so I think you've got to build bridges back a little bit and say, well, it's hard to see how some of these rounds might have been scored, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, and all you can do then is say, but this is how we score. This is how we think it is. Mm. Um, but you, you've hit on something there that I've discussed with a few people about the scoring of boxing. And I don't think it's fair for the fighters. And I always felt this. You, You've got to let the fighters know exactly what the judges are scoring. It can't be like it is now where one guy likes the stylist, you know, and the guy who boxes behind the left jab, the other guy's scoring the walk forward fighter. You've got to know, haven't you, how, how the fight is being scored. And yeah. this is how we end up. It's all so subjective. You mentioned the American commentators saw something different that night. I don't know what they were seeing different. <laughs> I, I, I would say they, they were calling it wrong. but. Um, because I've watched that back a couple of times and I did feel for Catrell. Mm. He would have been unified champion, undisputed light welterweight champion that night with the world at his feet. Do you, I mean, it's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's really and, hard. And do you think, do you, would you know, like what Ian says about the judges, he likes people who come forward, he scores aggression, he likes a bit more of a boxer. Like, are you even aware of these people and what they like? Sometimes for the big bites, you do your due diligence and you'll look up who the officials are and then try and have a gauge of what they're into mm. you always did it with the referee so you'd uh, you'd figure out is this ref referee mm. does he err on the side of caution and stop fights early does he let fights go you know give you give it a benefit of the doubt because mm. that's important um but yeah it's impossible because i've asked referees how to score about and they're and they just give you the same sort of fluffy answer and it's yeah. not necessarily their fault because i don't think there is a clear concise answer it's like well it's on you know boxing it's, it's on everything yeah but what's important what's yeah, the bit what's that matters important. because and it can't be who lands the most punches i think that's amateur boxing or at yeah. least it was when i was doing it, who lands the most that's very simple right sometimes within reason because even then you had to land the shots with a significant amount of power. You know, yeah. how do you measure power? And then only you get the guy that, taking the punch knows that. Mm, yeah, mm. and you get that. I mean, when you get the stats come up on telling you, like, oh, he's thrown thirty power punches and land fifteen. How do you know which one's a power punch? You know. <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot more audience interaction now, isn't there, Joe? Like, so you they want you to scan the VR code and score the bout so we can get what the people at home are seeing, but it also just sort of pushes everyone in the, the same direction, mm, you know? So it's true. not just the commentators now who sort of are leading it. It be the, the viewers sort of... Got to be a ringside to score a fight, else. though, haven't you? Mm. You can't score the fight really, not effectively off the TV. And you've got to be... That's the other thing, I think. There's got to be training of judges now as well so that you've got professional judges who are brought in at the last minute so you might not even know who the judges are going to be until two hours before the fight or the referee for that matter either i mean you've, you want to think of another example you were mentioning about referees and how they might referee what about joe cortez and ricky hatton yeah. fight with mayweather mm. so before that fight they play the american anthem and all the british fans you know five thousand, whatever it was of them 
um, boo the American anthem. And you could see Joe Cortez, who's, you know, is a proud American, thinking, oh, sod this. Yeah. And he's giving, and he's giving, and that really rebounded on Hatton. And I remember saying before the fight, that wasn't the smartest move by the British fans. I, I remember uh, you saying that. I remember yeah. watching it at home and you saying that and thinking he's done when that, as soon as that happened. And also it would have fired up Mayweather as well hearing it. And, and then it meant everyone was against Hatton that night. Everyone was against Hatton. And also, I mean, Cortez stopped Ricky fighting the kind of fight he needed to fight, didn't he? Mm. Every time he tried to get on the inside, he's jumping in and saying, oh, yeah. splitting him up again. So, I mean, he wasn't going to beat Mayweather anyway, but he definitely wasn't going to beat Mayweather with Joe Cortez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a look to 1997, Mike Tyson against Evander Holyfield. One of the most sort of infamous moments of the generation, really. Yeah. What are your memories of that one? The bite of the century the fight. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was the build up? I, you said I thought of that line at the time. But <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned it was hard to get near Mike Tyson in the build up. Did you get near, near to him that, that week? Very rarely. Uh, do you manage so, to chew his ear for any uh, interviews? Yeah. <laughs> he, he used to go. I took the only great interview I got, and it's the best interview I ever did in my career, and it wasn't down to me. It was down to him. When he came to London and fought Julius Francis, his manager, I think Shelley Finkel, said, he's going to do one interview and one interview only, and he goes, with whatever TV channel's got the fight. And I thought, well, that's us. Mm. So... <clears throat> They said, okay, set up your camera. So we set up the cameras on the top floor of the Grosvenor House Hotel. And um, Tyson wandered in, and he just happened to be in this, I don't know whether, you know, because he was, they were giving him things like Zoloft, you know, some kind of drug at the time. And he, but he was in this very amiable mood. And he came in and sat down and just opened up his heart for half an hour talking about, and I couldn't believe the stuff he was coming out with. He was saying, people think I'm a pariah. He said, uh, you know, I, I know who I am. I know what people think of me. They think I'm the gum on their shoe. He said, but I'm not that. They don't know me. They don't know the real Mike. They don't see me when I'm a father. And it was, it was all this kind of stuff. He was, mm. um, but generally speaking, in, to answer your question, mm. I'm, I'm going off on a tangent <laughs> here, aren't I? Uh, in Vegas, for most of the time, he had these heavies around him. He'd stand at the gym door and I'd say, could we come in and just grab a word with Mike after training? And I said, they said, we ain't, we ain't asking him. <laughs> so take your chances when he comes out. He goes, but it, well, you'll have to be quick. So a couple of times he stopped and uttered a couple of words like to us. And, and he'd, you know, so was, so he, he'd come out the gym and I'd say, I remember going up to him one day as he came out the gym with his heavies around him and said, Mike, could you just could you spare a couple of minutes to do for, for British television? And he said, I don't know about a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you'd thought I'd asked him to present news at ten. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so he did this interview, and and all he kept saying was about how he loved people in Brixton. He loved people in Brixton who had written to him when he was in jail, and um, and he and then he said, "What about you?" He said, "Have you got a Bentley like me?" I said, "No." I said, "I can't afford a, a Bentley." He goes, "Keep on doing, keep on doing interviews. You'll get a British Bentley." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was the kind of nonsense we used to get yeah. from him. It wasn't, you know, get stuff about the fight. No. Nah. It should have been, like, yeah, if you did more than two minutes, Mike, I might be able to afford a Bentley. Yeah. yeah. I might be able to yeah, do a bit exactly. more content. Yeah. But I did, get, I did get that great half an hour with him at the, the Grosvenor House Hotel. But, you know, that, as I said, that was down to him just being in a really talkative, open kind of mood that day that, that Bentley dealership in Brixton <laughs> he, uh, yeah, yeah. he gets in for a full hour yeah. every time he pops in can you remember at the end of that interview were you just like cha-ching like that is absolutely yeah. gold dust yeah yeah exactly that in fact I can remember I called my boss Vic Wakely no longer with us who was the boss of Sky Sports at the time and said to him you've got to clear half an hour you've got to put we've got to put a special on with this it don't you know don't cut it up into yeah, already yeah. it doesn't need editing it just needs putting on air as it is and to his credit he, they did they put it on 6.30 that night Mike Tyson special mm. and repeated it a few times as Sky yeah. used to and still do <laughs> yeah. but not the bite of the century wasn't like that the bite of the century wasn't like that. I mean, that was that was that era where it was very difficult to get around him. And, you know, it was interesting, those the, the fights with Holyfield, because do you remember the first one, which was a big shock, wasn't it? A lot of people thought Holyfield shouldn't be in there. There were medical yeah. issues maybe surrounding him. And ahead of that fight, um, I think there was, a, there was a feeling that Tyson was going to destroy 
Holyfield in there. And you remember how most Tyson opponents were beaten before they started. They looked like frightened rabbits in the corner as he got in. Yeah. Holyfield got in the ring for those fights, singing, singing to himself, whistling. And I, you could see Tyson look across the ring almost and go, not compute. I don't get this at all. <laughs> this guy, yeah, this I, is not, this I, is I, not this normal. This is what my opponent... Mm. So, you know, I think Holyfield had his number, didn't he? And Tyson knew Holyfield had his number. And I think he resorted to a kind of street thing. Yeah. Didn't he? When mm. he was when he was cornered this strap. All right, I'm going to... I mean, I couldn't believe what I, what, what I was watching. Um, in fact, I had to sort of watch till the replay to confirm because you don't want to say that there's <laughs> been a bite his ear off. there, hasn't it? It <laughs> just looked a bit like that. But it was unbelievable, wasn't it, the footage? Mm. Does pressure kick in at this point where there's something extraordinary has happened and you've, you want to deliver, like, the perfect summary of it? Or you just ha you're on autopilot. Yeah, you're on autopilot, really, because that you mentioned. Can you prepare for that? No, you couldn't ever <laughs> dream that it was going to be that. So now you, I mean, what you you mentioned? Do you know how big a story it is? Definitely, I knew what a big story. This is world mm. headlines. Mm. This mm. is Mike Tyson getting disqualified in a huge fight for biting his opponent's ear off. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's the only time I ever saw Don King. Uh, <laughs> afterwards, Jim Gray used to be the interviewer yeah. for American TV, you know, and Jim was a good interviewer. And he was talking to Tyson, and Don King kept trying to break it into the interview to explain it all. And and in the end, it's, and Gray turned to him and said, "Shut up, Don." <laughs> <laughs> this is life on air. And he did too. He shut up. Could you see the bit of ear on the on the canvas? No. You no, could... I didn't I didn't see that. I mean it was blood. <laughs> you could see blood. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean it's it it ended up in a jar on yeah. the Holyfield's desk. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you could just I remember that and just feeling like this is massive. This yeah. is mega news. It was yeah. almost like a cartoon, wasn't it? And you've got to try and find the words to to convey that to people. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what I said, if I'm honest with you mm. there, but I, yeah, you'd like to think you conveyed how huge a sensation this was. I mean, there were so many stories there and obvious reverberations and recriminations that were going to happen as a result of what had just gone on in the ring about whether Tyson was going to get thrown out, would never be able to box again, et cetera, mm. et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Can you remember, so that was obviously a Saturday night in America. Yeah. Can you remember what happened in the immediate aftermath? Because presumably your news desk and everyone else wants a bit of this. Like what, what how, in, as terms of your job as like a reporter as much as anything, then what, what happens then? Could you what, go to bed and get the flight home and forget about it? Or did you have to do extra bits? It would have been different if I'd been working for BBC Radio because then you were a commentator and reporter. Right, so yeah. I would have had to do a lot of reports as well. No, um, I, I remember doing some pieces for Sky News uh, follow-up stories on, on that but going to another Tyson fight the one he lost to Buster Douglas oh. I was still working so I was doing at that stage I was working a bit for TV but also doing pieces for BBC Radio as well and so when Buster Douglas beat Tyson in Tokyo I remember ringing in to BBC Radio newsroom and saying that this is a sensation here Mike Tyson's lost a world heavyweight title to this 42 to 1 up underdog <laughs> and the guy who answered the phone in the bbc radio 4 newsroom one of these sort of fairly intellectual guys goes well i'm not sure that's going to be a story for our bulletin he said <laughs> he said uh, he said i'll make i'll just make a note of it i said no no i said look i said put me through to the kind of yeah. place where I, i'm going to record a piece I said, I think you'll find you're going to use it when you talk to the other people there. Yeah. And when I got back to the hotel, I had 40 calls from different BBC stations. Oh, so you were in Tokyo? I was in Tokyo. Oh, wow. 40, 40 <laughs> phone calls from different BBC programs, radio and TV, asked me to come on and talk about what had just happened in the, in the, at that fight. It's always the same. There's the people on the desk. They, they just want to go home, don't they, at that point? They don't need you phoning in with a big story. He just, like, no, he just didn't know it was a story. Yeah. He was like, he was an e economics type boffin. If you'd have told him that the inflation rate was going to change, you'd have cleared the deck yeah. for it. But did Mike Tyson winning a fight, no, I'd hardly heard of Mike Tyson. So yeah. that, that was a busy, uh, a busy fallout then for you. 40 calls what did you how did you plot a path through those ones well I just did as much as I could I just got back on the phone and 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 kept doing reports and little 40 second pieces and two ways with different stations mm. um 
he couldn't, couldn't do it all. Um, yeah. But that was incredible because only three British media guys turned up at that fight, Douglas and Tyson. It was such a formality. Yeah. It was a bloke from the Daily Mirror. There was me and Colin Hart again. <laughs> yeah. can't keep bumping into Colin. So me and Colin were doing the Colin commentary. Hart speechless. <laughs> and guess what? This is another great story with that fight. On the day before the fight, you remember Tyson was going to win the fight and then fight Holyfield. Yeah. So Holyfield was, at, was there. So I'm in, I'm, I'm in the lift at the hotel on the day before the fight and Holyfield gets into the lift. And so I, I said, oh, you start making conversation with him. I said, oh, what do you think is going to happen? He goes, oh, Mike is going to win. I said, I, said, oh, I said, we might want to interview you afterwards. He goes, yeah, that'd be good. I said, where are you going to be sitting? He said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I don't, I don't know where they're going to put me. I said, we can come and sit with us if you want. So, you know, we're going to have a spare site at ringside. Said, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he came and sat beside us at ringside. And, of course, you know, the minute it happened, we were able to get, mm. you know, get his comments. In fact, we were calling, getting him to, if you listen back to that, there's a couple of bits where Holyfield comes in between the rounds and sort of says, <laughs> says what he thinks. I said, can you believe what Douglas is doing here? Yeah. And, uh, He's yeah, he's fantastic. He's like <laughs> he's fucking it all up. Yeah, yeah. he's like, oh, yeah, he's no. Made, that's what I said. Yeah. He's, he's just ruined your paint. <laughs> Can you remember in the build up to that? Were you was there any hint? Because I remember Colin said that he picked Ali to win the Rumble in the Jungle, for instance. Nowhere near as big an upset as as Tyson Douglas. Did he? Did yeah, he? Did he? he picked it. He was well, the only well, only British cool. journalist to do that. Good but cool. was there anyone? Was there anyone who was aware of just how much? Tyson taking his eye off the ball and the, all the Buster Douglas backstory. Was anyone any inkling that that was going to happen? Not really. No. I, if I'm honest with you, nobody saw that coming at all because Buster Douglas, I think there was a view of him. Yeah, he had a bit of talent, but he wasn't in love with the business of, of boxing much. And he was there for the payday and he wasn't going to have, you know, he wasn't going to have the balls really to mm. be honest with you and heart to, to withstand whatever Tyson threw him even if it was 60% of the real you know 1988 version of Tyson yep. which it kind of was by then but I don't think we realised just how bad his preparation must have been for that fight and how good Buster Douglas's was because his mum had died hadn't he mm. he really was absolutely fired up and you know for once in his career he produced this superlative brilliant performance did you think at the time that it would be the biggest like were you were you aware that it was the biggest upset in history or one of them yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah because you knew that what you just witnessed was absolutely mega in terms of a of a story <clears throat> of course they had a press conference three hours after that fight where they tried to take it away from douglas and don king and tyson showed up in this gym somewhere on the other side of Tokyo. We were all called to this press conference and, and, and he goes, well, the count went on too long in the eighth round and, uh, you know, it's going to have to be a reversed result and Mike's <laughs> still going to be the champion. And I remember the American writers being really upset and Don King goes, but we're going to give Buster a rematch. <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie Schuyler, who used to be the reporter for AP, funny, very funny guy, goes, what's on the undercard, Dempsey and Tunney? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he confronted, he stood up and confronted Tyson and said to him, how can you, with all your knowledge of boxing and the history of boxing and the heavyweight division, stand here and try to tell us you're still champion? You just got knocked out. How dare you stand here and tell us that is what, what, what are we listening to here? And, of course, within about 24 hours of that press conference, it had been laughed out of town, this mm. attempt to, re, to uh, reframe the result. Thank mm. goodness. Yeah. Power of the media. Power of the media. Power of the people. Power of yeah. the press. Power. Yeah, no, sure. Mm. Of course, we have a break there. Let's there. have a break. Have you got a feature after that? I've got a feature. Okay, we'll have a break there. It's the best feature. Best feature we've ever done? Ever we've done, yeah. Okay, we'll have a break. I'm George Groves, he's Deck, and if you haven't heard, the George Groves Boxing Club is going live, and tickets are on sale right now. Nice, our first ever live event, George. Are we going to start off on a nice low-key venue? Absolutely not, no. We are taking on the world-famous Shepherd's Bush Empire, and it is Frotch Groves free. It is 10 years, Deck, since mine and Frotch's fight at Wembley Stadium. So I've gone and got Mr. Frotch to come down, all the way down to the Shepherd's Bush Empire, and we're gonna tussle it out again. 
in podcast form. Nice, you could get the bus there again. Should we brainstorm a few other ideas? So it's going to be uh, the feature, and it will oh. be the best feature we've ever done. You, yeah. Maybe you and Cole could have a duel. We'll be crowdsourcing. For the, for the Mike Skinner's coming. He's crowd surfing. 50 Cent's going to buy the first three rows anyway. I don't think we could promise this. Frotch Groves Free, a decade in the making. Tickets are on sale now. Listen to the George Groves Boxing Club podcast for all the details. Right, we're back. We're back. It's feature time, Deck. Feature time. So, uh, Ian, every week with our guests, we knock together a little feature. Uh, and this is actually the best feature we've ever done. Best one ever? Best one ever. Okay. Knock around the, the feature name. It's usually a play on words for the guest, you know, as such. Um, I think it was your entry, this one. Could yeah. have been. What do we go for? We went with... Hello, darkness, my old friend. Hello, darkness, <laughs> my old friend. My old friend. <laughs> so yeah. what's the premise of the quiz? So the premise of the quiz is, um, in his UV deck, right? I've I'm got, not confident this I've week. I've got a boxing quiz. Oh, I wouldn't, yeah. I'll, so, I'll, sort of about... Your favourite deck. Okay, I'll mate, take that. Sort of about darkness. <laughs> 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 Which is like, it, it gives me poetic licence, I suppose. Uh, you're our guest today, Ian. We've got eight questions. You go, I go. Do you want to go first or second? Go on, I'll go first. Then. first right. I'm not in. confident here. Okay. Well, right. see. This so could be anything. Is it, yeah, it's, it's sort of tied in with a bit of darkness. Right? Okay. I want to know, Ian, what is the ring name alias, right, of former IBF middleweight world champion who finished his career weighing 248 pounds? I got it. Have you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to not be good at this. Very, I've been very, I haven't been able to prep this. <laughs> <laughs> what, he fought at 248 Yeah, pounds. he finished up heavyweight, 248 pounds. Middleweight. No, nope, I'm going to have to pass. James lights out Tony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lights out Tony. <laughs> I used to like watching him yeah. as well. Yeah, what a exactly. fighter. Oh, see, I'm not up to with what the a fighter. Thing of this, yeah, not I? enough prep, Ian, I'm right. afraid. Yeah, right. you're gonna, I think I'm going to get, get <laughs> wiped out here. We'll see. <laughs> right. It wouldn't be the first. Um, no, <laughs> He's good, isn't he? <laughs> he knows how two. this works. <laughs> right. I know George's you might, brain you might, works. You might, yeah, you might know this answer anyway. Go on. So in the movie Ocean's Eleven, yeah. which Ian's already mentioned, mm. Danny's team uh, caused a power cut. Right. Using a pinch, right? During a fictional boxing match. But can you tell me who was fighting? No. Lennox have you seen Lewis? Ocean's Eleven? Yeah, I have. Who were the two fighters? I in? can't remember. I know Lennox Lewis was in it. You need both to get a point. Uh, Vitaly Klitschko. Vladimir. Klitschko. Oh! I should have passed that. Yeah. Over. Did you know that? No. I've seen no I'd have got, got Lennox Lewis cause yeah because he's Ocean's in it 11. yeah you already yeah. mentioned we, it we, we already had a clue yeah, yeah. so they, they yeah they the little uh, a blackout yeah that's the darkness answer yeah okay right. I like okay, it yeah. right. so, so that's, how, that's how tenuous we're going with the yeah, dark yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh right yeah, cool. yeah. A, that's darkness surely in his essence yeah I'll accept it. yeah thank you okay right. fine right. Ian number three a female world champion who always wears black trunks with a gold trim. With, with, with the darkness angle. She wears black shorts. It's just the shorts of black. Oh, I see. Uh, Irish. Katie Taylor? Yes. <laughs> nice, you're back. <laughs> just because they could... The doors are jar. I don't want all the ECMs coming in and naming off, reeling off yeah. all these females in black shorts, but she's the Irish one. You know? Yeah, Chantal Cameron does too. Ken Norton. Yep. Right. Know him. He's got a few ring names, right? One's the Jawbreaker after his fight with Ali, but he's also known as the Black What? Black B in the darkness bit. Snake? No. Marine? It over. Marine? Oh. No, it was Hercules. Oh, the Black Hercules. The Black yeah, Hercules. That's a good name. Yeah. He should have lent on, lent on that more. You could take the lead here, Ian. Oh, I doubt it. There we go. So, a David Hay opponent, right? He storms the ring and ends up missing the top rope and lands face first on the Haymaker Promotions black canvas. <laughs> Do you know who that was? No. And the only thing is the canvas was black. 
Yeah. Monty Barrett? It was. was yeah. it? Yes. I only know that because that was your debut. Yeah, I had a debut. That was yeah, your yeah, debut. Yeah. So that again. Ah. Right. What's next? What, no, right. what number are we on? Right. Six. Six right. coming in. Ring alias of British super middleweight world champion. He finishes 42 5 and 1. Super middleweight? Super middleweight. 42 5 and 1. Mm. <gasps> Nigel Ben the Dark Destroyer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Had you had that, that one. I'd have got yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. This one's a bit tough, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> they all are. You, you, yeah, they all are. <laughs> should've, you should've gone first. Yeah. Right. Anthony Joshua Ooh. recently spent four days in total <laughs> darkness, right? And he claimed this is where what is made. Champions are made, I don't know. No. Character? Lions. Oh fuck's sake. You got to think, Joshua. What yeah. would Joshua say? Apparently, it was so dark the only way he could find the toilet is that to sniff for it. That's what his Lion, mate said. That's where lions. That's how lions, lions are made. Well, I mean, yeah. li- famously, lions are made on like the savannah. They're not made yeah, in a exactly. dark room. Yeah, yeah. In Kent. Yeah. Anyway, we've got one more. Last one coming in. Right. Hit me. Which female world champion reveals she's afraid of the dark when she starred in Channel 4's program Scared of the Dark? Sandy Ryan. Nah. Who's Big afraid? Pre. Before them. Olympic gold medalist. Oh. Nicola Adams. Yes. Very nice. That might be a draw. That's a draw. I've got no tiebreaker. <laughs> oh, I'm happy. I'll take the draw. Yeah. I'll take the point. <laughs> um, we kind of said this that, you know, we wish you, you wish you had said something. Have you got any regrets, any standout moments or any moments in your career maybe you didn't hype something up enough? Or, you know, when you, when you said you put your mic down, you thought, oh, mm. sh- I didn't give that enough. Or maybe I give that too much. Um, any fights that, that I think looking back there were some fights we covered uh, that you wish you'd been a little bit more entertaining on the commentary <laughs> or interesting on the commentary and I'm thinking of a few Johnny Nelson World <laughs> Cruiserweight title defences <laughs> thinking what more can we possibly say <laughs> here because every round is exactly the same with almost nothing happening and it, it's kind of like a nil-nil draw almost mm. um, saying the wrong thing I don't know. I, like I said to you, I often ended the commentary feeling like that was quite ordinary or we simply got away with that. We didn't hit any heights with it. But mm. if you're looking for a specific one, um, no, I can't, really think, I can't really think of one off the top well, of my good. head. That's good. Yeah. That's got to be a good sign, isn't it? Well, it is, but it doesn't mean... That <laughs> 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 He's <laughs> just forgotten about it, I banished it from the memory. Of, yeah. I mean, I've covered fights. I mean, my biggest regret was... That horrible night when um, James Murray died in in Scotland. That was that was the worst of of nights, really, um, because there was a guy who lived for it and he died for it. And I remember having to go around and and going around, we had to. His dad wanted to do an interview with us and talk about his son, and that was the most difficult thing I've ever done. Sat there with his picture on the wall, and. Um, yeah, it was horrendous. And there was a riot as well that night. You know, mm. the guy's dying in the ring mm. and there's a riot going on in this crazy small hall in in Glasgow. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's an almost impossible yeah, situation. Yeah, it's, it's very hard because you know, you know what you're looking at in the ring is verging on a tr- tragedy. Mm. Uh, that That's a skill, isn't it? To try and, you have to try and yeah find the balance, find the, the, the sort of the tone there, where yeah. to land on it. Well, that was another awful fight where I think it was one we did for some reason in San Antonio. It wasn't a British fighter fighting. It was a guy called Kid Akeem who, and he was carried out of the ring, obviously, and he got a blood clot on the brain. And the crowd, this Latino crowd, were chanting DOA, like, uh, you know, dead on arrival. Yeah. Uh, no, it was absolutely sickening. And I've always said about this sport, it can lift you to fantastic highs. It can, there can be sometimes nothing ever better than like a dramatic boxing night, like something like Ricky Hatton beating Costas you in Manchester. But it can also take you right down to the, mm. the pits of despair. So the whole gamut of emotions is there, really. So, and you never quite know at the start of any night which way it might go. Mm. You- you're, you're creating an atmosphere for the, for the listeners at home. Because they might not, it doesn't, you know, the, the noise in the arena doesn't transpire to the TV audience, you know. Yeah. So you, you've got to create that, um, that atmosphere, usually with excitement. But it's obviously it's sometimes you, it's different. you've got to manufacture that excitement if it's, if it's not an exciting fight. And also if there's a 
something sad happening, something yeah, tragic happening. Well, like find the like time. the night when Spencer Oliver, you know, was down in the ring at the Royal Albert Hall, mm. and you say not being able to prepare for something. Um, so we spoke Jim Watt and I for twenty minutes while they were treating Spencer in the ring, and the camera just stayed on it. You now this this scene with the medics. Mm. And I had to then go into all the background of what had happened with Michael Watson and how they changed the, the you know, the regulations now that there were new protocols in place for dealing with, with injured fighters like that. And I had to be able to produce all that really off the top of my head, just filling, filling the time and saying, you know, think we hope and pray that there's a happy outcome, yeah. you know, or a happier outcome here today. Um, but yeah, very di- a very difficult twenty five minutes. Again, nothing you could ever start the night having prepared for. Mm. Are there any boxers these days that you watch and think oh, I'd love to commentate on one of his fights? That'd, that'd be fun to cover. Just guy. occasionally, I'm, I, I vaguely and, and generally, I I don't miss it because I did so many big fights with so many big fighters, and like I said to you, I don't think you know I'd be able to do it at that sort of level again now. But yeah, if it's a big Las Vegas fight night. I sometimes feel a little part of me says I really would quite like to be there and do all that again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are your favorite parts about the? I whole... liked what uh, Crawford. Uh, oh, fantastic, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. Um, mm. Against Spence. Yeah. I mean that sh- performance should have got more publicity than it yeah. has done. He, he was amazing. Mm. That whole fight for the the size of the for the magnitude of that event was a bit low key outside of boxing. Didn't quite transcend like fights of that magnitude should really and that's a worry but because where the sport is in america mm. i think these days it's been a pay-per-view phenomenon in america now for so long that there is a whole generation of sports mad younger generation who've never seen boxing because it's never been on the main channels in america it's always been in the pay-per-view window and that's i think a danger for British boxing, there is now so many big fights. Nearly every big fight is pay per view. So, how many people are you actually reaching? And what's the next generation of boxing fans? The next generation of boxing fans are watching YouTubers. Yeah. Um, and you know that's another debate, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a tough commentary night yeah. as well. <laughs> Trying to call the action on two YouTubers. Yeah, but well, I don't before. miss having to do that because <laughs> I, I I liked to think that I called it as it was. And I wasn't going to be the promoter's puppet or anything like that when I was calling it. I called Fighter A against Fighter B and I, I wasn't going to be get myself involved in trying to big up championships that really weren't major championships. Yeah. They were kind of run by a bloke in a cottage in Norfolk or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Norfolk. Yeah. Um, who, before, uh, this might be a big question, but who was your favourite Brit, Ian, that you sort of had a chance to follow? You might have caught them at the early part of their career or just the big Vegas nights or something along the way. I always enjoyed covering Chris Eubank. Yeah, along the way because he was he was such a fantastic story, and sometimes a fighter has marquee value because people want to see him beaten. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think that was true with Prince Nassim yeah. Hamid and Mayweather. He, yeah, and Mayweather. Mm. That's exactly right. So, but Chris was was superb, and I, I'll tell you a little story with Chris Eubank. I mean, I think he lost a few of those fights, and he got given the decision. He fought a guy called Dan Shoma in um, South Africa. Wasn't much of a fight. Chris hardly did anything, you know, <laughs> in the fight. He got given it by a round or two. So we're, we're waiting to do the interview afterwards. Um, he's at Sun City. And there was a problem with the satellite. So I'm sitting next to Chris. Sorry about that. i am hit your microphone. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting next to Eubank waiting to do the interview. And he, and he turned to me and, and sort of with that sort of voice here. Who do you think won this the dark? He said to me, and I said, "Well, do you want a diplomatic answer or what?" I really thought, and he, he said, "No, tell me what. Tell me what you thought." And I said, "Thought you lost it, to be honest, Chris. You didn't do enough." And he turned to uh, he turned to Barry Hearn and said, "We shall have to look at the tape, Barry." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I thought nothing more of it. Two weeks later, I'm out sh- I'm out shopping, and my phone go- goes, and and it, it Chris Eubank here. I don't know how he'd got my number. He must have got it up from Sky, I think. And, he, and I, said, I said, yes. He goes, I've reviewed the tape of the fight. I said, yes. 
What did you think, Chris? He goes, hmm. I believe I lost it. I think you were quite correct. <laughs> and I just wanted to tell you. So. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to say you're fired. Yeah, no, he actually said he'd be. But he was a great student. Mm. He used to practice, didn't he? He used, he used to practice punches as he, uh, you know, in the, in the gym. He'd practice them a thousand times. So I think he had a deep understanding of the business. And I think when he really put his mind to it, like the Rocky Gianni fight, you know, when he's standing in front of all those Berlin fans mm. who are paying for his blood and produces this great performance, as he did, you know, in the first fight with Nigel Benn, et cetera. Uh, other times, you know, he crashed you know, with the weight, didn't he? L lost yeah. too much of the weight too late, et cetera. And so that's why he couldn't fight three minutes around. But, um, you know, I enjoyed covering, I, I enjoyed covering you, Ben, because he always gave you great quotes as well. Mm. We need one more thing, George. <laughs> ah, yes, we do. So we ask every one of our guests to give us what would be their ring walk track. What would be the music they would Ooh, pick cranky. if they were going to ring walk? Oh, I needed prior <laughs> notices. Now that's the key: is you don't. It's whatever's popped in your head now. Mm? It's whatever's popped in your head. If you think overthink it, you go too deep. I reckon mm. there's a song Have in there. Have you ever thought it before? In all your years of covering boxing? I haven't thought of... No, because I didn't ever think I'd make a ring entrance, George. <laughs> <laughs> then, now, there's a new idea for the promoters to get the commentators <laughs> to, to, have a, to have a ring entrance. That'd be brilliant. And you're a commentator tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 What would your tune be? Oh, crikey. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that thing by Eminem. Oh, which one? Yeah, yeah, you know, like the, the the thing that was in the lo Lose Yourself, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, the, the eight like mile that. one. Yeah, that dum 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 that, that dum, kind dum, of fits dum, for boxing, That'd be brilliant. It? Yeah, yeah. You've, got to, you've got to seize the moment. Yeah, and all that. I mean, I'd have lost, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have put me on it? Yeah. it depends who you're fighting. More. Well, yeah, the, the way things are going, you know. Yeah, it could be on Misfits. It. Yeah, you against Colin Hart or something yeah, like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Two of the two of the commentators fighting each other. Yeah, catch, Prob weight, catch weight contest. Yeah, problem um, is though, Ian, you don't give them ideas. If they pitched you against Jim Watt or Glenn McCrory, you'd be struggling. Well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so maybe not. Well, but Jim was Eminem. Yeah, Eminem Jim was good, yourself. wasn't he? Yeah, I mean that he was your two voices in tandem was just legendary combo. Jim was a very funny guy. Really, yeah. Jim was a very funny guy. He used to do magic tricks as well. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, he'd get he'd get sort of waitresses in bars in Las Vegas would look at Jim and get and go, oh my god, what did he do there? Like, <laughs> he'd like throw lights across the room at you. And he'd give you a little glove to put on your finger and he'd go, and he'd go, just go there to the bar. And he kept this little light on the end of his finger and he'd go, he'd go Ian, catch this. And he'd throw this light and you'd go, press your finger and, the, and it would light up. And <laughs> That is prep. That is wing, that's wingmanship as well for yeah, me. You are. What a setup. I, I, yeah. The he, lady behind the bar would say, you guys are from outer space. <laughs> 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 that's a hotel just off the strip yeah, 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 yeah. I mean what a place to leave it perfect uh, if from outer space Ian Dyke what a what a journey that was yes thanks so much for coming on pal that was, that was no, awesome. my, my pleasure great to talk to you and we haven't had Eminem on the on, we haven't had that tune on the Ringwalk playlist on Spotify all. I'm surprised nobody's picked that one no you know? that's a classic it's a classic get it on there and everybody likes that one don't they even people who don't like Eminem yeah. like that one you got a chance he might sing sing and ring walk you in <laughs> he did <laughs> Terrence Crawford <laughs> yeah how yeah. much would it cost to hire Eminem to do your ring good walk? question if you watch it he does watch this doesn't he, he does watch this yeah, yeah. he's a listener does he um, really yeah he's a listener oh yeah Wow. Big time. Big time. How yeah. do you know that? Because <laughs> he, uh, he's always messaging, asking to come on, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he might do it now. He might, yeah, he might. Well, actually, Glenn McCrory, who I used to commentate with for years, told me a great story about Eminem. And Go he on. said, I was sitting next to this bloke on the plane, and he said, <laughs> coming back from America, and he got to it, and he said, Oh, and Glenn was talking to telling him about how he was a boxer and now I did commentary. And he said, What do you do? And he said, I, he said, I, I do, you know, I sing some rap. And he goes, Oh, it. <laughs> He goes, yeah, my, my kids will probably know you. He said, what, what are you called? He said, Eminem. No way. <laughs> he didn't know who he was. He said, I got him to sign some things. Oh, that's amazing. He didn't know who he was. So, so maybe Glenn McCrory might be our route to Eminem. So when he yeah. got him, he said to his kids, he goes, have, have you heard of a guy called Eminem? <laughs> 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 yeah, Mavis can't wait to get off the plane so he can call him so he never guess who I've met on the plane yeah Glenn McCrory Glenn McCrory yeah. <laughs> yeah he inspired Mike yeah. Tyson he inspired yeah. Mike Tyson yeah, yeah. Well, he inspired with Mike Tyson <laughs> Ian Dark uh, he's in the club he's in the club nice one Ian thank you <laughs>